Inspector General Act of 1978 was um, responsible for establishing the OIGs as we know them. Originally, there were just 12, and now we have over 70, which, um, you know, some of us as auditees may not think that's the, the best thing in the world, but, you know, actually, they're, they're very important and useful not just to the federal government and to us as taxpayers, but they they serve an important role, you know, for us as recipients of federal funds, too. Um, I think the the primary importance is that they lend independence and objectivity to the oversight of the federal funds. Um, I just wanted to read one quote from the Act because I just think it really sums up the purpose and helps um, put the OIGs into perspective. The Act states that its purpose is to create independent and objective units to conduct and supervise audits and investigations relating to the programs and operations of the agencies listed in the Act. It also describes its purpose as to provide leadership and coordination and recommend policies for activities designed to promote economy, efficiency, and effectiveness in the administration of programs and operations, and to prevent and detect fraud and abuse in such programs and operations. So I don't think there's, you know, anything for us to argue with in that. Um, you know, it's very worthwhile, and I, I think that we can all understand the importance of the inspectors general. Um, you know, something else that I, I think it's important for us to keep in mind, and not everyone realizes that, well, you know, sometimes we think, oh well, you know, they're 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 going undergoing an NSF audit, and that's usually how we refer to it. We don't say an NSF OIG audit, and so I I think the perception can be that it's the same NSF personnel or or office that is responsible for awarding and supervising our funds, but you know, actually, you know, the OIG reports to Congress and to the agency head, or for NSF, it's the National Science Board, they don't report directly to agency management, and they're not engaged in the management and operations of the agency. Now, that's not to say that they're not available to be a resource and are, you know, utilized by the agency for their expertise, but they aren't involved to the extent that they that it would cloud that objectivity and independence that we talked about earlier. Because another thing you might not be aware of is that the OIG isn't just auditing, you know, the recipients of those funds. The OIGs are, are responsible for auditing and oversight of, of the agencies themselves and their operations. Um, one of you know the things I guess that you know that comes to mind when you think about this independence is um, well, what about then the other side of that? You know, what how are they held to account? Um, one of the ways that that takes place is because their reports are generally publicly available. There can be you know cases where there's um, information that can't be publicly disclosed, but but for the most part, these reports are are publicly available. But um, another way that the OIGs are um, you know overseen themselves is through peer review and um, through the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. This group provides uh, coordination between the OIGs and coordination in their development of policies and standards and other activities that ensure that, that the offices have well-trained employees. So um, I, I think just to sum it up, you know, the inspectors general you know, were created in a way that they're independent and objective but also held responsible for their activities.